my test one two three one two three anyone's got the right time the correct time according to rtm or tv3 or bbc one minute more okay mike you don't mind just two minutes more anyone else one minute more all right so shall we take the two minutes or one minute Okay, those of you who know Mr. R.K. Stevens, he's the manager, used to manage, I mean, he manages the bookings of the hall and all that, uh, just to inform you that he passed away uh, this evening at 5.30. R.K. Stevens, uh, the, the gentleman who was managing APC for many, many years. He was suffering from cancer, but uh, we didn't expect him to pass away so quickly this evening at 5.30, eh? just so we remember him in our prayers and his family as well. Okay, good evening everyone. So once again, thank you for taking the time to be here to attend a lecture, uh, a lecture on the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. Uh, when you were, some of you were here at Father Clarence's talk, remember? On the true in God, the Trinity. How many of you were here for that talk? All right, and I asked you, well, at that time it was about, there were about 90 people and I ask, is it the singer or the song? <laughs> what makes a song uh, popular? Is it because of the singer? Or is it because of the song itself? Remember that song by Celine Dion, Your Heart Will Go On? If anyone else had sung that song, would it be as a great hit as it, wa as it was or as it is if it's sung by someone else? Is it the singer or the song? Some say half, half. Uh, half half. Anyway, so the song today is on baptism and confirmation. It's not a very interesting song, nor the singer. That's myself, Dr. Stephen. And those of you who do not know me, uh, once again, I wish to inform you that I'm not a medical doctor. If you are sick, heart, heartache, maybe I can try to listen to you and counsel you. But body ache, back ache, head ache, tooth ache, uh, everything else that comes with the body, physical. Uh, illness, I can't help you. I can only recommend two Panadols. <laughs> right, thank you for coming and uh, let's see what the Lord uh, teaches us. Huh? It's the, finally, it's the Lord through the Holy Spirit and me as His instrument who will be teaching us today. And let us acknowledge His presence with us as we pause and acknowledge who He is in our lives as we make the sign of the cross in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Loving Father, once again we want to thank you for this day. Thank you so much for being with us, watching over us, protecting us, providing for us and blessing us in so many ways, Father, throughout this day. And so often, Father, we take your blessings for granted. We did not even recognize or acknowledge these blessings, Father. And for this, we want to say, so sorry, Father. So sorry that we fail to acknowledge your blessings and your presence throughout this day. And right now, Father, we want to say thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. And most of all, we thank you for your Son, our Lord Jesus, because through him we have eternal life. And we pray for the soul of Mr. R.K. Stephen, who passed on this evening, Father, your son, your child. And we offer, him, offer up his soul unto you. Have mercy on his soul. And we pray, Father, that you will be present, that you will strengthen his family and comfort them at this time of grief and mourning. And Father, we also pray that whatever arrangements that are being made in the coming days will go on smoothly and will go on, Father, that, that will be comforting to the family. 
And Father, as we lift up this session unto you, we also pray for the guidance of the Spirit in each one of us, who has come to dwell in each one of us at our baptism, that the Spirit within us will teach us and that we will understand to become greater, uh, more aware of the sacraments of baptism and confirmation, the wonderful gifts that you have given to the church and through the church to us. And Mary, our mother, you are interceding for us even right now. And we pray unto you. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you amongst women. And blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us in this now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, welcome. All right, this talk is also being... Uh, live stream. Nah? So if you turn around, you'll see that young man in the green t-shirt. His name is Ignatius. I need to introduce him to you. He's from the Social Communications uh, Department, no, Ministry, Social Communications Ministry. And he uh, takes his time and he comes here in order to live stream the talks so that at this moment, there are also people watching the, uh, or viewing the talk from home, uh, from home. But it's always better to be here in person. You get to see me live. Eh? Get to see me live, all right? So we also welcome those who are watching from home. All right, so we have this talk on the sacraments of baptism and confirmation. It's very difficult because the sacraments themselves are as old as the church. The sacrament of baptism and confirmation goes back to 2,000 years. 2,000 years. Even from the time the church began. The church teaches us that the church was born on the day of Pentecost. On the day of Pentecost. And from that time, the early Christians have been baptizing new converts into the church. That is why I say baptism and confirmation is as old as the church. And that is why for me as a presenter, I have to decide. I have to make a decision as to what I have to put in and what I have to leave out. Because I can't cover 2,000 years of history within three hours or at least two and a half hours because we have time, some time for a break. So I try to limit or focus our session today on two important dimensions or two important perspectives. And that is the historical how did the sacraments develop in the church historically until today? Because many of you are, have questions. Many of you are being asked questions about why at one time in the church we had the three sacraments that were given together, baptism, confirmation and the Eucharist were actually given at the same time. And why is it today we have infant baptism and confirmation at the age of now it's in form 5, that is about uh, 17. And why Holy Communion at the age of 9? So this is history, and it's important that we know about this. And the second dimension that I would like to speak to you about, or the second perspective, is theology. What does the church say about the sacraments? Theologically, eh? theologically, alright? So this, my, this is what I'm going to focus on uh, for you with us today, for you today. Right? And also, uh, since I already mentioned my name here, so as I said, my doctorate is in theology. I'm not a medical doctor. My doctorate is in theology. Theo means the Greek word for God. Ology means the study of God. No doubt we can't study God, but that's the word, theology. Just like psychology is a study of the psycho, the mind, the psychic. Eh? Uh, sociology is a study of soci society. Cosmology is a study of the cosmos. Anthropology is the study of the study of man or human beings, right? how human beings develop uh, in the world. So, let us go immediately to the meaning of the word baptism. The word baptism comes from the Greek word baptizane. Baptizane. Now, don't think this was, we often fall into the idea 
that the words that we use today in the church were Catholic words, were theological words, were spiritual words. No, this was ordinary Greek language. When they say to dip, to plunge, okay, to go under the water, they would say baptizen. Just like the word church, ecclesia. The word Greek word for church is ecclesia, which means a gathering of the people. Now, originally, the word ecclesia just meant a gathering of any group of people who come together, not just for religious matters or for spiritual matters. When people gathered together, they were an ecclesia. But after some time, the church adopted this word ecclesia, the word baptizen, to denote something religious, something spiritual. So the word baptizen was a common word in Greek used by people ordinarily to speak of when we plunge into water, when we dip into water, and so on. Is that okay? So we talk about that. So when the church began to use this word, it began to link it to the, resur to the uh, suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. The suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus is known as the Paschal Ministry. Whenever you hear of the Paschal Ministry, it means the suffering, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now why is this so? Remember Jesus died. And what happened to Jesus after he died? What happened to Jesus after he died? He? He resurrected immediately. What happened through the three days? Please, huh? I often say, huh? we are not here to learn about uh, our, you know, we learn here to learn about theology. So we say after he died, what happened to Jesus? He was? Buried where? In the tomb. And then what happened? Went down where? He went down, yes. Okay, so it's important that we be clear when we say went down, went into the tomb, these are all baby talk. Alright? I can even say, eh, we have been spoon-fed too much. And so today, I, the reason why I'm a bit more, uh, I'd like to challenge, not challenge in a bad sense, eh, in a good sense, why I like to challenge lay people, because I'm a lay man. It's time for us to start eating solid food. Enough of baby food. So this good, good answers, eh? go down, go to the tomb, all very good answers. But even a non-Catholic may tell us that same answers. Even a non-Catholic may say, Jesus went down, or he died, or he went to the tomb. Okay? So let us be clear. In our Apostles' Creed, he descended to the to the and what does that mean? No. To hell? No. Not to hell. Then where did Jesus go? You not to hell? Remember the word? Okay. Okay. So let me read from the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I will just pick up certain points from the Catechism of the Catholic Church, and that is what you, you, all of us should be start should be reading, the Catechism of the Catholic Church. That's solid food, not baby food. All right. In 632, number 632, Catechism of the Catholic Church. I hope you all know how to refer to the CCC. Okay, if not, I have to give you a class on that. Alright, I'll just go to... Christ descended into hell, according to the CCC. Right? Yes, he descended into hell. Christ, like all men, experienced death. And in his soul... In his soul, not his body, his soul. We teach, the church teaches that after we die, it's our soul that will be judged. And so his soul joined the others in the realm of the dead. But he ascended there, he descended there as the Savior, proclaiming the good news to the spirits imprisoned there. Once again I read, he descended there, to hell as saviour, proclaiming the good news to the spirits imprisoned there. The, then in, go down, if you go down to 634, it says, the gospel was preached even to the dead. The descent into hell brings the gospel message of salvation to complete fulfillment. Basically what the church teaches is that when you, when you quote from the CCC, it's the authentic teaching of the church. Not any one theologian, not 
any Tom, Dick and Harry, not Dr. Stephen. This is the official teaching of the church. Even a theologian's talk or a theologian's views we can dispute because that could be his views and opinions. But the CCC is, according to the church, the guaranteed teaching of the church. So Jesus descended to the dead, he descended to hell, and there, because that is the realm of the devil, that is where the devil is most powerful. That is where he reigns supreme. And Jesus descended to the dead, he descended to hell, and he broke the power of the devil in hell. He broke the power. To say, Jesus said, even here I am Lord and Master. I'm more powerful than you. He broke the power of the devil, and that is why the souls that were in hell later on raised, uh, were raised to heaven. At that time, the theology of purgatory wasn't, wasn't developed yet. Eh? Don't think in the time of the Bible there were already ideas like purgatory. No. They only believed there was a heaven and there was hell. There is heaven and there is hell. Not was. There is heaven and there is hell. So Jesus descended to the dead. His soul went down to dead. And on the third day, on the third day he rose from the dead. In number 638, CCC 638, the resurrection of Jesus is the crowning truth of our faith in Christ. So the very idea of baptism is to link with the death of Jesus, descending to the dead, descending down to hell, plunging into the realm of the devil, breaking his power and ascending to new life. That's why it's linked to the so when we are baptized, the church says, we too plunge to the, to the, when you are plunged into water, actually when somebody dives into water, he or she, if cannot, he or she, that person cannot swim, dies. But then because of Jesus, we are resurrected. We are raised from the dead to new life. So in a way, the, the, the baptism symbolizes Burial into Christ's death, just as Christ died, we too were buried, we too are buried in Christ's death, from, from which he rises up in resurrection. With Christ, we become a new creature. With Christ, we become a new creature. This is the meaning of the word baptism or baptizing. Is it clear? Some of you, huh? I hope I'm not talking Greek. Huh? All right, so this is, just keep this idea in mind. Huh? All right. So, but then, uh, this whole idea of water and, and religion is not something new. We know that even in other religions, if you look at Hinduism, uh, this is the people uh, going to the river Ganges, the holy river of Ganges. This is in Bali. Those of you who have been to Bali would have seen some of these uh, places where people actually purify themselves, cleanse themselves. This is Amitra in India the holy place of the Sikhs. This is the golden temple of Amistra. Then we have the Muslims before they go to prayer. They purify themselves. They cleanse themselves. Of course, this is uh, Hindus. And this is Sikh. Uh, this is anyone? Yes, this is Japanese. Um, Shintoism. It's called Shintoism. Before they enter uh, the gate that leads to the temple, they purify, they wash themselves. So this whole idea of water and, and uh, cleansing is not just uh, only in Catholicism or Christianity. It was something that was very, very common even in the ancient religions as and in the Middle East and in Asia at that time. But what the Jews did, the Jews had a different way of looking at water purification. Now if you look at this picture, it actually shows you what is known as the mik, mik vef. How do you pronounce that? Mik, mik vef. Eh? It's actually a bath used for water purification. That means if you look at the uh, Old Testament, you'll find, for example, in the book of Leviticus, you'll find many examples of uh, God telling Moses to tell the people that they need to purify themselves. For example, if you take Leviticus chapter 12, Leviticus chapter 12, you'll find the whole uh, chapter speaking of purification of women after childbirth. 
purification of women after childbirth. It gives step by step what the woman has to do after childbirth in order to purify or cleanse herself. Eh? This is the. Or if you look at, for example, uh, Leviticus 14, it talks about purification after having skin diseases. Those have been cured of skin diseases, even of leprosy. What are the procedures that they need to go through before they can uh, be accepted into society, be accepted into the community? Let me read, for example, from chapter 14 of Leviticus and verse 9, just to give you an example on verse 9. Chapter 14 of Leviticus, so Leviticus chapter 14, verse 9. On the seventh day, uh, God is telling, or Moses is telling the people, if you have skin disease and you have been purified or cleansed, then what you need to do is on the seventh day, you shall again shave your head, your beard, your eyebrows. Of course, they're referring to men. Eh? Uh, and all the rest of the hair on your body, you shall wash your clothes and take a bath. And then you will be ritually clean. So this is an example. So in Judaism too, we had this practice of ritual cleansing with water. Ritual cleansing with water, right? Now this is the modern version. If you can see from the back, this is the modern version of the same idea here. Right? Now the ritual immersion, this is called immersion, where you actually dip a person into the water. So the Jews also had this practice of ritual immersion. It was called the villa, huh? the villa, to achieve ritual purity. So when they say bath, the person is supposed to take a bath, it actually means ritual immersion. They immerse themselves into the bath. So the homes will also have such a bath. Even at home, they are, uh, they'll go and dip themselves to ritually clean themselves of any uh, impurity. And later on, several Jewish communities, because remember when you talk about Jewish communities, different parts of Israel, certain Jewish communities began to adopt the purification by water, or what we call washing rites, as a rite of initiation. So this is an example, right? This is a modern example. This is a modern example. But in the ancient times, there was also what was known as the baptism of Gentile converts. Gentile means non-Jews who wanted to enter Judaism wanted to become not Jews but enter Judaism as a religion, they were required to go through uh, ritual immersion, full immersion as we see it. Eh? Okay? It will be done in a place like this, in the ancient, in the ancient uh, Jewish tradition, in the Jewish tradition or history. They will have to go through and be immersed in the water. So they, they didn't see how many times. Eh? What they do, but what we know is that those who are Gentiles, have to be, because they are considered impure, in order to join the community of the pure, that is the Jews, they have to go through this ritual purification. So that's why it's important to note that when we talk about the baptism that comes later with John the Baptist and with Jesus, it's connected to the Jewish tradition. It's not something totally only Christian. It's not a, 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 a uniquely Christian uh, practice, it, has, it will come with a unique Christian interpretation, a Christian meaning by the time of John the Baptist. Now in the New Testament times, you'll find that there were, as I said, many, uh, some communities that were already practicing water purification or ritual immersion. And one of the most famous was the Essenes. Eh? This co community lived in Qumran, a place called Qumran. How many of you have been to the Holy Land? All right. So shy to say you went to the Holy Land. Have you, did you go to Qumran? You're one of the places they take you, if you go to for pilgrimage to the Holy Land, is they take you to Qumran. Eh? So you'll find, sorry if those of you from the back, it's actually a desert place, a desert. All right. Why, do this why is this community important? Because they felt that the Jewish people were becoming too lax, too relaxed. And they wanted to live a more stricter form of Judaism a stricter form of Judaism, fasting and real abstinence, you know, even abstaining from, uh, from communication. So a group of Jews moved away into the deserts and they lived in the caves. They lived in caves. Eh? And part of 
their community. If you go to Qumran today, it's a huge complex. Of course, the buildings have all uh, broken down. You, you can, uh, you have the caves are still there, right? The, even the churches were well, not churches, sorry. Even the uh, so-called the places of worship were within the caves. You will find places like this, which are again baths, uh, the baths, what we call the mikaf, the mikaf earlier. And what happens is that whoever wants to join the community, whoever wants to join the community, that means they too wanted to come and say, I too want to be a member of the Qumran or the Essenese, they were expected to go through a ritual cleansing. So in this way, it's a ritual of repentance. To so say, look, you have to leave the world. The world is a bad place, a sinful place. If you want to join our community of the pure, you have to ritually cleanse yourself. And so the person would have to go through the purification process in such a pool. This is a drawing of uh, some of the uh, members of the Qumran. Besides that, they also used to have a daily ritual by which they purified themselves or cleansed themselves with water to ensure that they are cleansed. Remember, you enter the community, you have to cleanse yourself. You go through a ritual immersion. Then to make sure that you are clean every day, not that you only take a bath, okay? Okay, I don't think they even took bath because it was a desert, not enough water. But they have to cleanse themselves ritually. Their hands, their feet, maybe their heads, uh, and maybe other parts of the body. All right? So scholars say, or scripture scholars say, that John the Baptist was a member of this community. Not all the scholars agree, of course. There are debates. Some scholars say he was part of this community and that he learned about ritual purification or he learned about what we call today baptism from this community. And he left this community to be on his own. Significantly, they say, John the Baptist lived in the desert, just like the Qumran community. John the Baptist was very strict about his diet. What did he eat? What was John the Baptist eating? Chicken and mutton? Uh, you all know what he ate. Lah. I don't know whether we can eat that. So, th so he was living out a lifestyle associated with members of the Qumran community. But other scholars said no. He was unique because he was, the way he went about with his ministry, he was different. He was on his own. And also the fact that he preached a different message from the members of the Qumran community. So we now we come to John the Baptist. Now whether, he not, whether or not he was a member of the Qumran community or not, as I said, scholars have written books about it. If you want, please go and read. Huh? You can find out from, uh, about this in the internet. There's much that's been written. Is John the Baptist a member of the Essenes or from the Qumran community? You'll get lots and lots of articles. Okay? So, let's look at John the Baptist. Right? So when he started to baptize, remember as I said, Baptism is, was, is not uniquely a Christian practice. It was already practiced in the Eastern religions, ancient religions. Then Judaism was also practicing water purification, although they don't, didn't call it baptism. Right? They didn't call it baptism. And then John the Baptist continues from there. And his baptism, he says, repent. Remember, his message was one of repentance. And was a message of repentance and conversion to new life. The second thing about John the Baptist baptism was that if you look at the Mosaic law, if you look at the laws of uh, Israel, it was about cleansing the Gentiles. The Gentiles were considered impure, unclean. So if they want to join the Jewish community or Judaism, they had to purify themselves, right? We saw that. But in the case of John the Baptist, he says, it is not just the Gentiles who are unclean. You, the Jews, are also unclean. You, the Jews, are also not living according to the message of God. And that is why he was very, very hard upon the scribes and the Pharisees. When the scribes and the Pharisees came, he challenged them. He said, sir, what did he call them? Brood of vipers, isn't it? or something like that. He was quite harsh eh, towards them. He said, look, just because you are Jews, don't assume you are going to get salvation. You too must cleanse yourself. But before you cleanse yourself ritually, you need to cleanse yourself 
internally. You need to experience conversion. Don't come to me without internal conversion. Don't come to me without an inner conversion, a change of the heart. In fact, the true meaning of conversion, conversio, means to turn around. The word, Greek word for conversio, C-O-N-V-E-R-S-I-O, to turn around. If I'm walking into the, let's say I'm a person who's constantly angry, everything upsets me. And I'm angry about it, angry with my wife, angry with the dog, angry with the cat and all that. And then I want to experience conversion, right? So here I am, then the next day I want to say, I want to be more patient. I want to be more patient eh? with my spouse, for example. So I turn around, isn't it? Then, you know, you know how it is, not easy. Then how many degrees must I turn around before I experience conversion? 180 or 360? Uh, 360 means I go back to my own style. Eh? Okay, 180 degrees. That's what that's the word conversio means, to turn around 180 degrees. So he's telling the scribes uh, and Pharisees, you can come to me for baptism, but if there's no repentance in your heart, it's no use. You've got to cut the root, and the root is your pride, your arrogance. So he's saying it's not only Gentiles who need cleansing, even you Jews need cleansing. And this was a different message. It was a different message. Because even the Qumran community actually spoke about the Jews, only the Jews needing, sorry, uh, talk about unclean and clean, eh? And for John's baptism, what you have, it only takes place once. It's not a repetition. You don't come back again and again for baptism. It's once you convert or you change your heart, and that's only once. Or else, in the Jewish tradition, you need to reach, uh, purify yourself perhaps daily or monthly or weekly or even yearly. Annually, you need to purify, cleanse yourself. But in the case of John, you only, he says, only once. And finally, what's different about John's baptism compared to the baptism of the Jews? In the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish ritual practices, you cleanse yourself. You cleanse yourself. It means you pour water and wash your hands, wash your head, wash your face, and wash your feet. But in the case of John's baptism, he administers the baptism, which was something very, very different. He administers the baptism because he calls him, he, he feels called by God to be God's prophet and therefore he is God's instrument to baptize sinners. Is it okay so far? Uh, just, just see the flow. Eh? Alright. So when we look at the, at the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, the word Synoptic often refers to the three Gospels of Mark, Luke and Matthew, Matthew, Luke, Luke, and Mark, because you see a lot of similarities among the three. Many things written in this one gospel of Luke, you can also see. So we, synoptic means to have a kind of a view that we can see over this tree. So in the gospel of Mark, Luke, and Matthew, we'll find something very common. For example, in Luke 3.16, John says, eh, they ask you, in what, whose name do you baptize? The scribes and Pharisees ask him, and Jesus says, I baptize you with water, but one more powerful than I will come, the tong or the sandals of who, sorry, the tongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with Holy Spirit and fire. In Matthew 3:11, you'll find almost something similar. John says, uh, John concludes by saying, He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. In Mark 1, 7 to 8, John concludes by saying, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. So this is a totally different dimension from the Jewish idea of ritual cleansing. John is taking it to a holy, holy, total, uh, a new angle of how we are to look at ritual baptism. And he talks about the coming of one who is mightier than he and who is going to baptize people with the Holy Spirit. This is a new language, a new idea, a new form of baptism. So by this, John is saying that prepare yourselves. As I baptize you, repent and prepare yourselves for the coming of one who
who is the Messiah. For the one who is going to bring the kingdom of God. Once again, something totally new among the Jews. The Jews never heard this before. Okay? And so this is why the baptism of Jesus became, eventually became very fundamental to the Christians, to the early Christians. Don't think that the early Christians already had an idea of what Jesus' baptism was. Remember, the scriptures only began to be written, for example, the Gospel of Mark, around the year 60. Okay, Jesus, according, Jesus was uh, lived up to 30, 30 to 33. Okay, historians say 33 uh, AD to signify Jesus' ascension or Jesus' end of life in the world. That the Gospel of Mark was written around 60 to 70. The Gospel of Luke was written about 90, 80 to 90. Sorry, John was about 90. Uh, Mark was about 70. Right? So don't think the scriptures were available to the early Christians. It was only later that they began to develop an understanding of the baptism of Jesus. And when they look back, they began to realize the significance of the baptism of Jesus. That it was something that was more than just a ritual cleansing. It was, more importantly, the coming of the Messiah, the advent of the Messiah who began his ministry, the beginning of the ministry of Jesus. And what also struck them was that if you read again the three Gospels, Mark 1, sorry, Mark 1, 10 to 11, Luke 3, 21 to 22, and Matthew 3, 16 to 17, you'll find again something very similar, the synoptic Gospels. As Jesus came out of the water, this is Mark 1 to 10, eh? one, sorry, Mark 1, 10 to 11, he saw the heavens splitting apart, and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, You are my dearly loved son. And you bring me great joy. That's one version. Alright? So you'll find the same message in the other two Gospels. So what is important? When the Jews, sorry, when the Christians began to look back and began to try to understand the baptism of Jesus, it took place a long, long time before uh, you know, Christianity became really uh, began to understand who Jesus was. When they look back, they began to see how important the baptism was. Because one, it was the time the Messiah had come, and the kingdom of God was at hand. And secondly, by his baptism, Jesus was acknowledged and appropriated. In other words, the Father acknowledged and said, "This is my Son." It was at this moment of baptism that Jesus uh, was the a special appropriation and acknowledgement by the Father and the Spirit of who Jesus is. And the Christians saw in this experience their own adoption as children of the Father and of the Spirit. So if this can happen to Jesus, the Messiah, now through Jesus, our Lord and Savior, through our baptism, we too are Adopted by the Father as his children. Adopted by the Father as his children. Is it okay so far? All right. Any questions? Now, the Gospel of John is not part of the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, John had a different style of writing. He wrote, uh, he was, the Gospel of John came out, was written around the year 90, much later than the Synoptic Gospels. In the Gospel of John, John links baptism with the Holy Spirit. He gives prominence to the Holy Spirit. Even though Luke and Matthew and Mark speak about the coming of the Holy Spirit at the baptism of Jesus, but here John links the baptism, sorry, baptism with the Holy Spirit. For example, in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus answered to Nicodemus, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and spirit. So John is bringing the idea of the spirit very powerfully in his gospel in connection with baptism. In connection with baptism. Because it is the spirit that will enable the baptized to live according to Jesus' way of life. That's what John is saying. It's only with the spirit that you can live the truth. 
It's only with the spirit of Jesus can you live the values and the life that Jesus wants you to live. And then you'll find in John 19, 34, 35. Remember I told you I'm just giving you some samples. Eh? I can't cover 2,000 years of history. I hope that you will be it's like giving you an appetizer. Lah. Before the dinner, they give you kacang putih, isn't it? Some kacang, something to eat before you have the main course, right? If you go to the restaurant, they'll give you something to, a chili to chew on, uh, maybe chili padi to, to, uh, to, uh, maybe to bite or something before you get the main meal. So I want to give you the appetizer so that you will be interested and keen to do your own research. I cannot spoon feed you. I can only give you appetizer so that you can feed yourself with solid food. Alright? Okay. So if you look at John 19, 34 to 35, know the episode where the soldier pierced the side of Jesus and water and blood came out? That is very symbolic. According to the church, water means baptism, blood means the Eucharist. In the early church, when John was writing, he was actually talking about baptism and the Eucharist. Water and blood coming out of Christ symbolized this very two very important Sacraments. Of course, at that time, they didn't call it sacraments of the church. So John was saying, baptism and the Eucharist and the church, all this, baptism, the Eucharist and the church, draw their faith, their active faith. They only make sense, they only have meaning from the person of Christ and his suffering, death and resurrection. John connects the baptism of Jesus to the Eucharist and to the church. And then he goes on, all right? You find this little thing here, 1 Corinthians, sorry, 1 Corinthians 10, 16 to 17, eh? all right? Now, we are linking this to the, uh, uh, how do you say to, he's linking this, we are linking this to the uh, episode of Paul in the Corinthians, all right? Where he talks about the cup of blessing which we bless is it not the fellowship of the blood of Jesus? The bread which we break, is it not the fellowship of the body of Christ? Saying that there is one bread, we are, who are many, are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. So John eventually links that communion, the acceptance of baptism and Eucharist with communion with Christ. With communion with Christ. Alright? And then another thing that emerges from the Hold on please. Huh? It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verses 16 to 17. Thank you. All right. And then eventually you'll find in the Acts of the Apostles, the Apostles talking about the name of Jesus. In Acts 2, chapter 2 verse 38, for example, this is just one example. Peter says, Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized. This is after Pentecost, eh? the experience of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. See, so from the Acts of the Apostles, we'll begin to see, the epistles of Paul, you'll begin to see, baptized in the name of Jesus. For the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So what is this name of Jesus? What does the scripture scholars say when Peter and Paul talks about being baptized in the name of Jesus? Firstly, it means we enter into a personal relationship with him. To be baptized in the name of Jesus means we enter into a personal relationship with him. To enter into his radiant spear. What's a spear? You know that this is a spear, for example. Not spear as in the thing that we used to kill people. Spear, S-P-H-E-R-E, -E, that whole area. That means we enter into that area, into that, into that compound, into that realm where Christ is our master, where Christ is our Lord, Christ is our saviour. To enter into this radiant spear and to participate in the spiritual power which is working in him, his divine spirit. That means to enter into relationship with him in the Holy Spirit when we are baptized in his name. Remember, I have often described this. Eh? Why do we need the Holy Spirit? 
Why was it important for Jesus to give us the Holy Spirit after he ascended to the Father? When Jesus was on earth, he was a human being, fully divine, fully human, but he was still a human being. And therefore he was confined by space and time. Confined by space and time. Like all of you here, can you be in another place right at this moment? Can you be in, at home right now? Right now? Because you're confined by space and time. Your body can only be in one place at a time. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that. And that is why when he ascended, he said, I will give you the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God. The Spirit of the Father. My Spirit. Which means that with the Holy Spirit in us, we, the Holy Spirit can be the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus. Jesus can be present with us anywhere at any time. He cannot be confined by space or time. Wherever we go, He is with us because nothing can limit His presence. And so Jesus felt, if I'm not leaving you orphans because I'm giving of myself to the Spirit so that wherever you go, I dwell in you. I am with you. I will be with you until the end of time. That's why the Holy Spirit was, is a very important. Uh, the, it was important for Jesus to ensure that He gives the Holy Spirit to the apostles and from the apostles to all their followers, the disciples of Jesus. To continue, the name of Jesus also means to enter into a personal relationship with Him as, his, as He is our master, as one's master, and we become His follower in His name. Not just into a personal relationship, but what kind of relationship? He is our master. Is he your master? Oh, time off already. Yeah. Shall we conclude? Okay. Yeah. What kind of relationship do you have with Jesus today? Is he your friend? Sometimes I get worried when we sing sing song. What a friend we have in Jesus. Huh? And it becomes a buddy buddy and we lose reverence and respect for him. We have to be very careful. He's our master. And we are his follower. And if you study the role of a master and a disciple, you, you realize it's not an equal relationship. Okay, but Jesus has also made us his friends. Have made us his friends. Thirdly, to be baptized in the name of Jesus means to belong to Jesus and to no one else. I mean, of course, we belong to our family and to our spouse and all that. But we belong to Jesus. There can be no other gods in our lives. The biggest sin of Israel, if you look at the Old Testament, again and again and again, was Israel had a divided heart. The heart was divided. The heart was given to other gods. We proclaim with our lips that we love God, yet our heart is divided. According to James Fowler, James Fowler was a psychologist. Huh? He said that most Christians uh, fall into three categories of believing in God. The first category, he says, is called polytheism. Poly means many. Theism means, the word theo I said means God, many gods. That means we have no problems going to the temple, to the Sikh temple, sorry, not a Sikh temple, Hindu temple. This is not to downplay any religion, but Catholics, huh? Catholics going to pray here, pray there, everywhere they go, no problem. This ritual, that ritual, okay? They go and take part in the ritual. I'm not saying that they cannot, uh, you know, uh, go and visit their friends and all that, but they go and take part in the ritual itself. Now remember one of the things, because I, I used to teach comparative religion eh, in Babasan Open University. Uh, for, for example, in Hinduism, when they have an image, a statue, they truly believe that at a certain space in time, on a certain a period of time, the spirit of that god or goddess comes to dwell in that image or in that statue. And that's why they have, for example, when they have typhusum, that god comes to dwell in that area, in that statue, at that certain space and time. And then that's, and, and then no more. So that is, but for Christians, of course, we have statues. Do does the spirit of the saints come and dwell in, in the image? Do, do they? Oh, no, huh? Are you all sure? Sure. Okay. On the feast day, the saint comes and dwells in that image, you know, huh? 
Okay, thank God. So some of us have no problems about believing or going to a different, different gods, right? That's polytheism. Then he says, there are also Christians called monotheism, which means one God. Our heart is radically, undividedly given to this one God. That's monotheism. Are you a monotheist? Sure. Okay, he says many Christians, the majority of Christians, fall into what he calls henotheism. Heno. What does it mean? I profess with my lips that I believe in one God, but my heart is given to many gods. And he's not talking about uh, religious or spiritual gods, Buddha or, or Ganesha, or, you know, not that kind of gods. He's talking about what takes number one in your life. Money, your job, power. That is, he says, we profess, I believe in God, I will depend on God, I will give my life to God, but then we want to ensure that our heart is given to other things. We want this, we want to take that, we want to hold on to that, we want to grab this, you know. And then when our beautiful spouse gets a bit older, not so beautiful, our eyes go here and there, you know, because we desire for other things. So he says, look, we profess, and we say we believe, and we go to church and say, I believe in God the Father. But our hearts can be given to other gods, G-O-D-S, small g's, huh, in our lives. True or not? Please talk to the person beside you. Henotheism. Do we see henotheism taking place around us? So that's why I asked you, are we truly monotheist? Uh, now they say no. Eh? Okay, let's go on. Who do you? Eh? Do, uh, do we belong to Christ? Fourthly, to be baptized in the name of Jesus means to enter into his service. To enter into his service. That means to serve him as his follower. He's our master. And that's why one of the most important things that happen at our baptism, even though we are infants, we'll find out later, is that we are called to mission. We share in the mission of Christ. As soon as we are baptized as an infant, don't wait until you're older or you think you are free or you have time to enter into mission. You're already called to mission on the day you're baptized. All right, so that's important. We're called to serve Christ and the validity of our baptism is solely on Christ's authority, on no one else's authority. The church draws authority to baptize from Jesus. The, the significance of our baptism that we have received is based on the authority of Jesus, not even on the authority of the church. Without Jesus, the baptism that, given, that is given to us by the church has no meaning, has no significance. And lastly, when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, we assume and bear the name Christian. We are all Christians, right? We are assuming, taking upon ourselves and bearing the name Christian. Wherever we go, we are Christian. Bearing Christ. Are you okay? Can I carry on? Am I going too fast? Okay. In the Pauline letters, or Saint, uh, in St. Paul's, uh, in Paul's letters, all right, let's look at what, how Paul describes baptism. And again, let me remind you, this just appetizers. I'm just giving you some examples. I hope that you will go and do your own reading and research uh, more about baptism, uh, especially about what Paul says. Now, Paul does not offer a formal statement of baptism. He never writes to describe what baptism is. That's not his intention. But what Paul, nor does he intend to present a theology on baptism. But through his writings, we can get glimpses, we can get ideas of what Paul is talking about baptism. For example, in Galatians 3, 26 to 28, he says, For you are all sons of course, and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. This is from the Galatians. So what Paul is saying is basically, 
Baptism unites us in Christ. All of us, when we are baptized, even though we are baptized individually, but it unites us in Christ. It brings us into the realm, into the sphere of Christ's redemption. And that is why you'll find out later also one of the effects of baptism is that then we begin to share a bond with all Christians, not just Catholics, with all Christians. Because they too come under the realm of the redemption of Christ. The Paul also talks about being washed, sanctified and justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. I'm sorry, it's 1 Corinthians 6, 11. 1, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. It talks about being washed, sanctified and justified in the name of Jesus through baptism. What does Paul mean? He says, baptism takes away sinfulness from the person. It takes away sinfulness from the person who's baptized. But because we are cleansed by Jesus, we belong to him, and therefore we have to serve him. And one of the ways we serve Jesus is by living out the life that he demands of us. We must justify what Christ has done for us through our actions. In Colossians 2, 11 to 12, Paul talks about circumcision. In him you are also circumcised with circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised in Christ having been buried with him in baptism. Basically in this verse, what Paul is talking about is that baptism, he compares baptism with circumcision. Because Paul was writing to the Jews and in the Jewish tradition, circumcision was an important ritual. And so he's linking baptism, cleansing, the cleansing effect of baptism with the cleansing effect of circumcision. Where he compares baptism to circumcision. And he says, just as circumcision removes a small part of the body, baptism removes sin from the body. Okay? Then, in 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul states, For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, where the slaves are free and we were all made to drink of one spirit. Here, Paul talks about by virtue of baptism, we are all incorporated into the one body of Christ. So as I said, although Paul doesn't write specifically about baptism, in his writings we get these ideas. And from his ideas, scripture scholars begin to develop. The early church fathers began to develop what Paul was talking about with regards to baptism. The next verse here is Romans, Romans 6.4, Romans 6.4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, and that as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also walk in newness of life. Here Paul, Romans 6.4, Paul is talking about united with Christ's resurrection, a new life begins in us. Of course these are ideas that we saw earlier. But remember, Paul was writing in the 50s. Uh, in the 50s, about 20 few years, 20 or so years after the death of Christ. So he's developing, he's just writing, he's developing his own theology of baptism. And finally, just one more example. 1 Corinthians 6, 1. He talks about at 1 Corinthians 6. Sorry, 2 Corinthians 6, 1. Eh? I'm getting old, eh? my eyesight not so good. Okay, as God's fellow workers, we urge you, don't receive God's grace in vain by baptism. He says, don't think that just because you receive baptism, it guarantees you new life. You have to live that life that God demands of you, the values. So many of us here uh, must also be aware, just because we are baptized Catholics, doesn't mean that baptism itself will gain us eternal life. All right, We will be judged also by how we live our lives today. Alright, just one more, last one from scriptures. One let, uh, first letter of St. Paul, uh, 1 Peter, sorry, first letter of Peter, 1 Peter. This famous passage from 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, 
a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, why do I have these translations? Because when I go through the internet to find the graphics, I find these graphics, right? It's not because this translation is the, is the right one, all right? Now, if you can see, I use a lot of graphics. I spend a lot of time preparing. I want to ensure that the writings are big enough for you to see, all right? So it takes a long, long time to uh, prepare this talk, all right? I'm not that I'm posting, but to help you to understand and eh, make the connection between the images and the words. Now, this, according to scripture scholars, the first letter of Peter, or first Peter, was actually written to newly baptized Christians, those who were Gentiles who became Christians. It was uh, homely given at the baptism, at their baptism. And so Paul, uh, Peter uses terms such as born anew, spiritual house, the royal priesthood. So baptism is seen as an experience of regeneration, renewal. Regeneration means renewal, new life to the resurrection of Christ. Baptism is also not merely a rite of initiation, but a, communi a source communicating to the believer the life-giving power of Christ. Through baptism, we receive the power that comes from Christ. So all this, what I just presented to you is from the scriptures. To help you understand, if you put yourself in the shoes of the apostles and the early Christians, do not assume that they already had the developed theology of baptism. They too were trying to understand who Christ is, what was the significance of his baptism, what happens when we are baptized in the name of Jesus, what happens to us, what, does it, what difference does it make to be a Christian when we are baptized in Christ. So this is what we are trying to look at in the first part of our, the first few slides of our talk. Can I go on? We'll take a break at 8.30, is it okay? We started at 7, 8.30, is it okay? Because eh? I've got a few slides to cover before we have a break. Now, once the last apostle died, who was the last apostle who died according to tradition? John. John died around 110, 100, 110. Eh? Now, there were a group of uh, people called the Apostolic Fathers. Now, I can't talk in detail about this because these are all church history. And I love to read about the church fathers and apostolic fathers. You must begin to get, this is the link between the apostles and the bishops today, the apostolic fathers. There were a few of them uh, which we have records of. There are writings from them, right? So they are, these are called the apostolic fathers. Then after the apostolic fathers, we have a group of uh, theologians called the apologists. Apologists, all right? Now, who are the apologists? Once Christianity began to grow and more and more people became Christians after 313 AD, after 313 AD, when Christianity was made an official religion by Constantine and many most people were Christians, then the problem was uh, they began to have become, there were false teachings in the church, false teachings called heresies. So these apologists were the ones who defended the faith. The word apology doesn't mean to say sorry, eh? The word apology, apologies means to defend the faith. Uh, to defend the faith. And then after that we had, uh, we had theologians. So this is around the 2nd to 5th century. 2nd uh, to 5th century. If I have a talk on church history or the church fathers, then I can go into detail. But as of now, I need to proceed. Uh, because we're talking about baptism. Uh, are, you all okay? are you all giving me your undivided attention? Thank you. Not to add. Okay, just joking with you, all right? All right just, I'm just going to take one, uh, just take a few excerpts from the writings. And these writings are actually, uh, not or the, the original writings are not available. But remember, people copied these writings. Not copy as a copy in an exam. The only way they, they can reproduce was by copying it word for word. In those days, we used to write on a skin, uh, skin, lamb skin and goat skin and on, uh, on uh, deer skin uh, not on paper right so they were used to end paper eventually parchment so they were copying uh, so many of the original writings are no more they said no more extend which means they are no more existing eh? these were all copies right but there is a very important document that you as catholic we must come to know called the didache d-i-d-a-c-h-e According to experts, it was 
written around the year 50, as early as 50, as early as the writings of Paul, and some scholars say as late as 160, between these two dates. But whatever it is, these writings were called the Didache, the 12, the teachings of the 12 apostles. Although it was not written by the 12 apostles, right? But it was called the Didache. And I've just taken one excerpt from the Didache. So in case you're wondering where this uh, baptism came from, why are we baptizing as we are today? Remember, it was already happening around the year 50 to 160. And a writing about it is available. Okay, who is the author? We do not know. All we know is that it's called the Didache. Eh? Now concerning baptism, this is talking to the early church. Baptize as follows. After you have reviewed all these things, it means after you have interview, interviewed them, you have made sure they are ready for baptism, the, the, the people, the catechumens, baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. According to the Gospel of Matthew. chapter. Yes? No, not, not canonical. Canonical means in the scriptures. Don't, uh, don't confuse. Huh? When we say it's, it's in the canon, means that it is one of the books uh, approved by the church as inspired by the Holy Spirit to be included in the canon of scripture. Because in the early church, there were many, many writings. There were many, many gospels. So the church had to decide which gospels could be included in the canon. Canon means a list of scriptures that consists of the Bible today. But a book like Didache would fall under tradition. That means it is accepted by the church as part of our tradition. And one day, if I have time, I'd like to talk to you about the relationship between scripture and tradition. Because once you understand that, you will make the connection very easily, but not today. All right? Today we go to baptism. This is part of our tradition. Eh? It's accepted by the church. And, uh, by the church. So let's go on. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit in running water. That means a stream. Then something, a river in running water. But if you have no running water, then baptize in some other water. As long as it's water. Not Coca-Cola or 7-Up. Eh? People ask me, doctor can baptize with Coca-Cola or not? No, the church says water. Clean water. Because water is what is available everywhere in the world. Even in the desert, you will find some water. All right? Then he goes on. But, and if you are not able to baptize in cold water, then do so in warm. But if you have neither, then pour water on the head three times. So people ask, how come we Catholics pour on the head three times only? It's as early as first century. Sorry, second century. First century, second century, they were already doing that. All right, just remember. So I'd like to talk to you more about our tradition because you find the link between scripture and what we do today through the church fathers. So do your research and you'll find a lot of amazing things. Okay, Pour water on the head three times in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, so don't doubt. Because we are Catholics, we are not sola scriptura. No sola scriptura? Talk to the person beside you. What's sola scriptura? Sola means guess. Only. Scriptu only. Yes. Because when Martin Luther, during the Reformation, he, he actually talked about three things, three important points. Scol uh, sola fede, only faith, no good works. However good works you do, you will not guard you salvation. Only gracia, sola gracia, only grace, and sola scriptura, no tradition. Because he didn't want tradition. So only, so that's why our brethren, those of them who are non-Catholic churches, they only focus on the scripture. But we have tradition. And that's causing us, uh, that's why we, our kids need to study baptism, uh, sacrament, church, or your power, la, they all uh, pity them. But it's part of our tradition, part of our church. We cannot, we shouldn't do away with it, all right? Okay, let's go on. So the writings of the church fathers on baptism, basically to defend the Christian faith, defending Christian baptism. For example, this famous uh, Justin Martyr, who was an apologist, who lived in the second century, writes to the Jews. He's an apologist. That means he's defending the faith against the Jews because the Jews were attacking Christianity. So he is saying, what need then if I of circumcision? Because the Jews prefer circumcision. Who have been witnessed to by God. What need I have of other baptism? Because remember I told you, 
the Gentiles were baptized. Remember I spoke to you about the Mekaf and the full immersion that the Gentiles had to go through to enter Judaism? So it was happening at that time. So he's saying, what need I have other baptism? All right? Who have been baptized with the Holy Ghost or with the Holy Spirit? They use a lot of symbols. They use symbols as to the water. They use symbols of the great flood, of the Noah. You know? As for example, we have Tutulian who lived around the 3rd century. He writes, we little fishes, after the example of ictus, the word ictus means fish. Fish eh, in uh, Greek, the word ictus. All right? The first sign of Christians, actually the, the earliest symbol Christians used to identify themselves was a fish. Uh, was the was a fish. All right? A fish. After whom? Peter the fisherman. Peter the fisherman. Linked to Jesus because Jesus Peter was Jesus' first I mean apostle and the first Pope. They used the fish. So in those days when they were persecuted by the Jews and, and later on, even by the Romans, pilgrims would go from one village or one town to another, would look out for this sign. Would look out for this sign. Because it shows it's a Christian home. And there they could find safety, they could find food, they could have refuge and rest. It was only later that the cross developed as the symbol of Christianity. But initially, it was the fish, right? So he says, after the example of Ictus, Christ Jesus, our, our fish are born in water. We don't have safety in any other way than by permanently abiding in water. They use a lot of symbols in their writings. And then, what else, sorry? They also gave a lot of instructions on baptism. This is Hippot, huh? Hippolytus. Those of you who want, just go to Hippo, Hippo, huh? L-Y-T-U-S, Hippolytus. His famous writing, The Apostolic Tradition. Where there is no scarcity of water, where there is enough water, the stream shall, shall flow through the baptismal font. He's telling how to do it. Through the baptismal font or pour into it from above. But if water is scarce, there's not enough water, whether on constant condition or on occasion, then use whatever water, to avail water is available. Let them remove their clothing because in the early church, they would be baptized without clothes on. Eh? But there would be, a, the, that's why those days they used to have the women deaconess. Ah, women deaconess. They would hold a cloth ah, so that the women would go and the bishop would then uh, baptize them. Ah, then the men would go one side. So they would uh, remove their clothing, then baptize first the children. This was around the second century, yeah? second, third century. Baptize first the children. So where did children baptism come from? It's not a recent development. It was already taking place in the second, even third centuries. Baptize first the children, and if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Otherwise, let their parents or other relatives speak for them. So a lot of the things we do today comes from our tradition. They are not found in the scriptures. Jesus didn't say, eh, only scriptures is the word of God. For us, as Catholics, traditions also constitute the word of God. And according to the Catechism of the Catholic Church, both sacred scripture and sacred tradition are to be given equal reverence and honor. Because they come from the same source. This is important. It is fundamental that we understand this. Okay? All right. Finally, one more quotation from the church father. All right. The church was redeemed at the price of Christ's blood, Jew or Greek. It makes no difference. But if he has believed, he must circumcise himself from his sins in baptism. Right? Not circumcised as the Jews, so that he can be saved, so on and so forth. Eh? So basically, eventually something developed. The idea that baptism is necessary for salvation. This idea developed around the third century in the church. Even Mark 6.16 says, He who believes and baptized shall be saved. What does this mean? Actually, baptism, you are saved not by the ritual. It's not the ritual. It's not the pouring of the water. It's not the words that actually saves you. It is Jesus. All right? In other words, because the fact that it is Jesus who has given that life-giving power to us through baptism, because of Jesus, we are saved. So when we say salvation is necessary for 
Baptism is necessary for salvation. In other words, we're saying, because we need Jesus. The ritual itself has no meaning without Jesus. We recognize Christ as our Savior in the name of God who sanctifies us in our encounter with Him. Baptism obtains its significance through Christ. It is without Christ, baptism would have no significance. Alright? For those of you who are copying notes, lah, I'll put it all out so that you can copy it straight away. So, if to believe in Jesus is necessary for salvation, if to believe in, to, to believe, to, re, to be baptized is necessary for salvation, not to believe in Jesus, according to the early church, is to be condemned. Alright? Go back to this. Eh? He that believes in whom? Not in baptism, but in Jesus, and is baptized, is saved. So not to believe in Jesus is to be condemned. Not the fact that one is not baptized, but one, the fact that one does not believe in Jesus. And that is why in the early church, when a catechumen, catechumen means one who's preparing himself for baptism. Even today we have RCIA, we have people baptize, preparing themselves for baptism. If a, bap, if a catechumen is martyred, even without baptism, without being baptized, he is considered as baptized by the blood. It's called the baptism of blood. Even today in many countries, if there are people who are keen or interested in becoming Christians, but have not been baptized, but they are killed for their faith, they are, church considers them as baptized. Baptized by blood. Sorry, yeah? Because their death expresses a faith far better than ritual baptism, than water baptism, for they actually die in Christ. Right? I will. Okay? Then there's another one eventually developed called the baptism of desire. Baptism of water, baptism of blood, now baptism of desire. What does this mean? That means sometimes a person may not be at fault. The gospel may not have been proclaimed to him or her. But that person may have an inkling of who Christ is, may have a desire of wanting to know Christ, may have a desire to become a Christian but never went about doing the, or taking the action of becoming one. So in the point of his death, this person can, is also considered baptized by the church, called the baptism of desire. Pe people can live according to, the, according to St. Ambrose. Okay? People can live according to the gospel in such a way that without having an opportunity for a person, personal choice, for it, they desire baptism unconsciously. Like this also can happen. Eh? A person could desire baptism but remains unbaptized due to ignorance of faulty decision. Such a person can be saved by votum baptismi. That is, the desire for baptism. That is why we have to preach eh, Christ because God has linked salvation with Christ. There's no salvation for anyone outside of Jesus Christ. So it's the fact that the sacraments are not effective in themselves. The originality of the sacraments, yes? According to the church, some, some people may actually live a life that is very Christian, very, very Christian, no? And they may not even, uh, how do you say, uh, they, they live according to the values of Christ, although they are not Christians. So in that sense, they don't desire baptism because they don't know what baptism is all about, but they have this desire to live a life that is very according to the values of Christ. That's what the church talks about, baptism of desire. The, uh, it's not the... Uh, how do you say it is something that they do not even uh, because they do not know what baptism is all about but they live that life that is pleasing to God no they are conscious of the values of Christ they never accept Christ or the name of Christ they never say Jesus Christ but something in them makes them want to live out the values of Christ as I say it's, it's 
All this is deep theology. I can, I can go deeper and deeper, but time is of essence. Eh? All right. So the, the importance of sacraments is not in what they do. God can do all that is needed for human salvation without sal sacraments. But they make what God is doing visible in, and tangible in a human symbol. Water, oil, all these are human symbols. They signify what God is doing for us. Sacraments, we say outward signs of inward grace. What we see with our eyes, we hear, we smell, we taste, we feel, but internally there's something happening in our lives. Inward grace is being received. So what we see in a sacrament, first and foremost, is the salvic fig action of God. God's salvic fig action, God's saving action. We do not see, can you see God's saving action visibly? Can you see God putting grace into our heart? Can you see God cleansing us of original sin? Can you see it uh, tangibly? Can you see that? No. But it is the sacraments, the symbols that give, that signify that this is happening. So we, when you look at the symbols, we know inwardly this grace is happening. Okay? Now, over the centuries, two important rituals developed. I'm going to take a break at 8.30. Eh? Two important rituals develop. The first one is, of course, what we call baptism, taken from the early church, a quotation. As they stood in, as they stood in vase deep in the font, they were immersed three times. Immersed eh, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This is what we call water baptism. Rebirth from water and spirit. This is what is symbolized. Then, as they emerged, the bishop imposed his hands on them, on their head, anointed their heads with chrism, and traced a sign of the cross on their foreheads, probably with chrism. So two actions within one act, ritual act, ritual uh, within the initiation act. Two. Eh? Over time, so this is called the reception of the Holy Spirit. They are clearly going together. The two actions but going together. Later, this, this uh, ritual would be called confirmation. I'll tell you why. It would be called confirmation. So in the Western Church or in our Catholic Church, baptism and confirmation are celebrated as two different or separate actions within initiation. They're not one. They're actually one action and another, but still it's one initiation ritual. Eh? Finally, the, eventually the word confirmation appeared around the 5th century. Because the early church never used the word confirmation. They just had initiation. Okay? Rit ritual, water ritual, and then the anointing with oil. It was called initiation. Gradually, sec the second part of initiation was reserved for the bishop. Because as more and more churches began to grow, and the bishop could not, it was the bishop who always baptized, who, who conf confirmed and gave the Eucharist. But as more and more churches began to develop, more and more churches began to grow, the bishop could not be there all the time. So eventually the second part of the ritual became separated because the bishop could not be available at every church. We're going to look closely into that as well as to why, eh? Baptism and First Communion was celebrated by the priest whenever the bishop was unavailable. That means if the bishop was there, he would baptize, confirm, and give the Holy Eucharist. If the bishop wasn't there, the priest would do the baptism and give the First Eucharist or the First Communion. And whenever the bishop came into town, he would do the confirmation. But if the bishop came first, he would do all three. That was what the practice was in the early church. I want to go quick. Uh, uh, okay. I think we'll take a break. Lah, huh? Are you all okay? Or can I go on until 8.30? Can can absorb? Okay. All right. Before I go into the history itself, just a bit more history. Eh? I just want to talk to you about infant baptism. Where did this come from? Okay. Now in the Bible, there's no mention of infant baptism, right? 
Anyone saw an infant baptism? No. What we hear is references of baptism of households. Right? Cornelius and the household. So we assume that there could be children and infants there. So these are some of the scripture passages that we have in the Acts of the Apostles. Right? But recorded evidence of infant baptism does not appear until about the year 200 AD. About the year 200 AD. By the 3rd century, infant baptism was a fact. It was a fact that infants were being baptized by the 3rd century, around the year 200. For example, uh, Irenaeus of Leon, 190, says, Jesus came to save all through himself, say who through him are reborn in Christ, infants, children, youths, and old men. He makes references to infant baptism. Hippolytus in 215, baptize first the children. Remember this quotation earlier? And if they can speak for themselves, let them do so. Tutulian, Tutulian didn't like the idea of infant baptism. The very fact that infant baptism was going on and he didn't like it, he makes, the, he makes a statement. With respect to children, it's preferable to defer baptism in accord to each candidate's character and age. He says, I don't agree with infant baptism because infant baptism was taking place. Gregory of Nesiansus, let no opportunity, let the infant be, say, let's allow see no opportunity, let the infant be sanctified from childhood. So by that time, it was a, okay, an Augustine. Eh? Anyone wonders why children born of the baptized should themselves be baptized? Because baptism is the most, sorry, is most assuredly the sacrament of renewal. Because at that time, don't forget, eh? the idea of original sin had come into place in the church. And so, baptism was not about initiating people into the church anymore. It was also conferring grace upon the child. And because at that time, infant, uh, infants were dying at a very, many, many uh, babies were dying, Augustine was saying, baptize them. Because we don't baptize them before they die, it's most likely they will not receive salvation. Uh, that was the thinking of that time. Eh? So that's why eventually infant baptism and baptism immediately after the birth of the child became very, very common. The rise in the understanding of original sin and belief that baptism washed away the stain of original sin. Okay, from Romans 5.2. Sorry, 5.12. Okay, so we take a break before I go into to this. Just to show you uh, the development of the sacraments along the Yes. Okay, let me go back. Take a break. 15 minutes, is it okay? Alright, those of you who have not had your dinner, please go and help yourself. Those of you who are still hungry, if there are extra food, please help yourself. But wait for those who have not had their dinner. Thank you. So we will start at, uh, now according to my clock, it's 8.25. Is that so? 8.25? Can we start at 8? John? 840 or 845? 840 lah. Okay, thank you.